Hello everyone, my name is Michael McBaddy, and today I'll be discussing diabetic ketoacidosis. I would like to start off by thanking Dr. Beatrice Lupsa for all of her guidance in making this video. In today's presentation, I'll discuss the pathophysiology of DKA, common etiologies, a five-minute bedside assessment, and the treatment. I'll be highlighting the foundational principles that every medical student and resident should know. Lastly, we'll discuss how to write up the assessment plan. To understand DKA, it is essential to understand the role that insulin plays in glucose homeostasis. DKA is a disordered metabolic state with absolute insulin deficiency with an increase in counter-regulatory hormones such as glucagon, cortisol, and catecholamines. In this diagram, we can see that insulin has different effects at various sites within the body. Starting in the adipose tissue, without insulin, lipolysis occurs, leading to a production of fatty acids that then travel to the liver. In the liver, these fatty acids undergo beta oxidation, resulting in the production of ketones, specifically acetone, acetoacetate, and beta hydroxybutyrate. These ketone bindings are acidic and lose a proton in the bloodstream, leading to a metabolic acidosis. In the liver, with the lack of insulin, glycogen is broken down into glucose, and gluconeogenesis is ramped up, leading to worsening hyperglycemia. Now, let's take a look at the muscle cells. In DKA, these cells cannot take in glucose, which further worsens the hyperglycemia. Moreover, muscle cell proteins are broken down into amino acids to serve as building blocks for glucose. In the kidney, hyperglycemia induces osmotic diuresis as high sugar levels overwhelm the kidneys. This osmotic diuresis leads to dehydration, hyperosmolality, electrolyte loss, and decreased renal function. The final result of this imbalance is hyperglycemia, ketone production, metabolic acidosis, and hyperosmolality. Here is a simple mnemonic that I find useful to help remember some of the common etiologies that can trigger DKA. These include infections, such as UTIs, pneumonia, and cellulitis, infarctions, insulin deficiency, infant, as in pregnancy, intoxication, and iatrogenic, particularly certain medications as well as holding insulin. Let's take a look at the five minute bedside assessment for a patient with DKA. Now that we understand the pathophysiology, Clinical presentation is based on resulting metabolic derangements. Due to the osmotic diuresis, patients become very dehydrated and develop polyuria, which is increased urination, polydipsia, increased thirst, weakness, and dry mucous membranes. When severe dehydration occurs, tachycardia and rarely hypotension can also develop. Ketone production leads to metabolic acidosis that can cause nausea, vomiting, air hunger, tachypnea, and cool small respirations as the body tries to compensate for this acidosis. The diagnosis of DK is based on laboratory testing in the right clinical context. It is based on a blood sugar of more than 250, an anion-gap metabolic acidosis, and evidence of ketone production, either on serum or urine testing. Rarely, patients can develop DK with normal blood glucose, particularly as a side effect of SGL2 inhibitors. As you may remember, the serum anion gap is calculated by taking the serum sodium minus the serum chloride and bicarbonate. The anion gap is lab-dependent, but generally above 12 in DK and the pH in patients with DKA is low, it must be at least below 7.3. In order to make this diagnosis, the following lab workup is needed. An arterial blood gas, a complete metabolic panel, hemoglobin A1c, phosphorus, magnesium, ketone levels, preferably serum beta-hydroxybutyrate, although a urinalysis for urine ketones is also acceptable, and consideration for an EKG and infectious workup if indicated. This workup will usually demonstrate hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hyperphosphatemia, even though total body potassium and phosphate levels are usually low. Well. The treatment of DKA is complex, and most institutions have algorithms in place to help describe treatment guidelines. The foundations of treatment are volume depletion, insulin, and correcting electrolyte abnormalities. Many patients with DKA are severely dehydrated and have to require large amounts of fluids to recover. Patients should be volume resuscitated with a bolus of 1 to 2 liters of isotonic fluid and then started on maintenance fluids at a rate of around 200 to 400 milliliters per hour. Once a patient's blood sugar is less than 200, glucose in the form of D5W should be added to the maintenance fluids. Regular insulin is used for treatment of DKA, as in its IV formulation is rapid acting and can easily be titrated. A bolus of around 0.1 units per kilogram of regular insulin should be given, followed by starting an insulin drip, 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. 
It is important to remember that in DK, the insulin drip must be frequently adjusted based on the trend of the patient's blood sugars. In a gap is closely monitored in DK as it indicates the amount of ketones in circulation. Once it is resolved, it indicates that the imbalance has been corrected. Once the NN gap has closed, it is very important to remember to give subcutaneous long acting insulin, which is overlapped with the insulin drip for a few hours before treatment is completed. The main electrolyte disturbance that occurs during treatment is hypokalemia. The body will try and compensate for metabolic acidosis by exchanging potassium ions or proteins in the blood. As the acidosis improves the treatment of DKA, potassium levels drop. It's also important to remember insulin helps drive potassium into the intracellular space. For these reasons, potassium levels should be closely monitored approximately every 2-3 to three hours during treatment. Once the potassium level is less than 4.5, potassium should be added to the maintenance fluids. Similarly, hypomagnesemia and hypophosphatemia can occur during treatment, and these electrolytes should be monitored and replaced as needed. Some patients with severe acidemia and a pH of less than 7 may benefit from bicarbonate. Lastly, it is important to remember to treat the underlying cause that may have triggered the patient into going into DKA. The assessment of DKA should include relevant laboratory testing, particularly the serum pH, which is a marker of illness severity and the largest factor for determining the level of care the patient needs. The assessment should also include a discussion regarding the suspected inciting event, such as an infection. It is also important to discuss the patient's underlying diabetes, including home medications, hemoglobin A1c, type of diabetes, and medication compliance. The plan for DKA should include the frequent monitoring and repletion of electrolytes, as well as any workup indicated to discover the underlying ideology. What I hope to take away from this presentation is that the pathophysiology of DKA involves a state of low insulin and high counter-regulatory hormones, leading to elevated blood sugar, production of ketones, acidosis, and osmotic diuresis. Diagnosis is based on serum glucose, pH, ketones, bicarbonate, and anion gap. The treatment of DKA is centered around hydration, insulin, correcting electrolytes, and addressing the underlying cause. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the Yale 20 video on diabetic ketoacidosis.